Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Ali. I'm a doctor based in the UK. And in this video, we are talking about four hobbies that genuinely changed my life. And that sounds really clickbaity and superlative, but it's actually true. Uh, these four hobbies really changed the trajectory of my life in interesting ways. And so for each of them, I'm gonna tell, tell you about how it started, uh, how it's going, and the interesting lessons and takeaways that I took away from it. So if you're in the market for a new hobby to start, you might get some ideas, or if you just wanna hear the lessons I've learned in over a decade of trying to do fun, fun little hobbies. Let's start with hobby number one. All right, so hobby number one is coding and web design. Now this started when I was 11 years old and I was in the school's basement computer room because me and my nerd friends used to play games on miniclip.com back in the day, shout out to the miniclip OGs. And there was this kid who was like 12, like the year above. And I saw that he'd right clicked on the Google homepage and he'd clicked the view source button. And there was all this like really cool looking text on notepad on his screen. And I was like, damn, this guy's a real hacker. This is like really, really cool stuff. And then I thought, oh my God, this is so cool. I want to be a hacker. I want to be the sort of person who knows this sort of computer stuff. And around that same time, me and my nerd friends, we were playing these text-based role-playing games on like online. Uh, one of them was called Kings of Chaos, where you like build an army and you get your missiles and you attack one another, but it's all based on text. Like, Ali has attacked Sahib and has taken a black powder missile from him, all this, all this sort of stuff. And I kind of had in my mind that it would be really cool if I can make, if I can learn the hacking coding-y type stuff to make a game like Kings of Chaos that I was addicted to along with my nerd friends. And so that is what started me off on a journey of learning how to code and how to make websites and how to make stuff look pretty and web design, graphic design, all that kind of stuff. And really doing this like web development stuff was the primary source of excitement in my life when I was a teenager. I would look forward to school break times and lunch times because I'd be able to go on the computer and do more coding-y type things. I would look forward to going home from school because once I'd done the bare minimum I needed to do to kind of ace my homework, obviously, um, and once I'd like, you know, spoken to my mum about what, what my day was, I was like super excited to get onto the computer and I started trying to do freelance web design. I would bid for these projects and I, I started this thing of trying to make money on the internet by creating websites for other people. So that was how it started. In terms of how it's going, um, I still dabble with the design and the code stuff a little bit to this day. Uh, I recently did a redesign of my personal website. You can check it out at leobdell.com if you like. It'll be linked in the video description. But overall, there's quite a few different lessons I've learned from the coding and web design journey over the last 15 years of my life. The first one is that when you learn how to code, it like really, really unlocks your brain in a very interesting way to, to be able to see ideas for things in the world around you. And this sounds a bit abstract, but if you've ever thought of trying to come up with an idea for a business, if you're that sort of person, I was definitely that sort of person. Until I knew how to code, I just didn't have that part of my brain that was just unlocked where I could suddenly see these business ideas everywhere. When you know how to code, you kind of know a little bit about what's possible when it comes to computers and like making an app and making a website for something and even making physical products some of the time. But if you don't know how to code, you start seeing these patterns everywhere and you start realizing that you can apply your coding skills, even at a very basic level, to uh, kind of see these business ideas everywhere you are. So learning how to code was what ultimately helped me come up with basically all of the business ideas I've had since then, which have been like 20 plus. And secondly, other than just knowing that the idea exists. When you know how to code uh, and you're a reasonably proficient standard in it, once you get to that standard, you start having that power to, whenever you come up with an idea, you can then put it into practice in like a weekend or a week or a school holiday or whatever. So for example, when I had the idea of starting a question bank for medical school applicants like 10 years later, I knew, okay, I know enough about coding to be able to code this from scratch myself. When I had the idea for making my company SixMed, which helped people get into med school, again, like eight years after I started to learn to code, I knew, okay, I can probably whip up a website in about a week and it wouldn't be so hard. And really one of the things I'm most grateful to about like my coding career is that I sometimes think that even if, even if I lost everything in terms of, you know, if this YouTube channel goes, goes to zero, if I get struck off the medical register for making a terrible mistake at work, which is unforgivable and I'm not allowed to be a doctor anymore, if I literally lose everything, I'm like, I'm pretty confident that I know enough about coding to be able to learn the rest that I need to be able to get a job as a software engineer at some kind of company. And so that's a real sense of job security in a way that is not tied to anything else that I do in terms of YouTube or in terms of medicine. If you wanna learn how to code yourself, then there's tons of resources on the internet. The one I would personally recommend for learning Python, which is the world's most popular programming language, is Brilliant, who are coincidentally very kindly sponsoring this video. Brilliant is a fantastic online platform with courses in maths, science, and computer science. Uh, and I'm, I'm a particular fan of their computer science series where they've got an introduction to Python and an intermediate Python course. And it teaches you Python 
in a very nice, engaging, interactive way that's not boring. And really, when it comes to learning how to code, there are broadly two ways of going about it. Uh, number one, you can pick your own project and you can work on it. That's how I learned to code. I learned to code by having my own project and then, and then working on them. But if you don't have a project, and this is the position that a lot of people who watch this channel are in, I get tons of messages on Instagram being like, how do I learn to code? And if you don't have a project you're already working on, then it's very easy to go through an online course on something like Brilliant, where you can just like, it walks you through, it's fun, it's engaging, it's interactive, and you can learn Python to a reasonable standard by the end of it so that then once you've learned how to code with Python, you can then think, oh, okay, the world has suddenly opened up to me. I now see these possibilities everywhere I go. It's like you've like stepped into the matrix, stepped out of the matrix, something like that. So if that signs up your street, then head over to brilliant.org forward slash Ali and the first 200 people to hit that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Let's move on to hobby number two. And hobby number two is music. Now in terms of how this started, I had a bit of an inferiority complex back in the day and still do to, a, to an extent where part of me feels like I am not valued, valuable as a human being unless I'm doing cool things. Uh, and certainly when I was younger, when I was in school, uh, my only real identity was being like a massive nerd and, have, and getting, getting good grades in exams. And so I was always looking for these other alternative ways to diversify my identity. I was like, hey, I can be cool if I become a musician. I'll be cool if I know how to sing. But it was really when I got to university, it was in my second year of medical school, I was attending some event. And there was this guy who was my age, he was also a medical student, uh, and he was a guitarist and a singer, and he performed on stage, and he sang an incredible rendition of Eric Clapton's Tears in Heaven. And it was so sick. And all of the girls in the audience were like swooning over this guy. And I was looking around, I was like, damn. A, that guy's absolutely sick. B, this song is a banger, I'd never heard that song before. And C, I really wanna to get to a point where I can play guitar and I can be reasonably good at singing so that I can perform and girls in the audience will swoon for me as well. So I decided the next day that I was gonna become that guy and I went down to the local secondhand shop and bought myself a 30 pounds or $40 guitar. And there's this website, justinguitar.com, really good free tutorials. And I just followed those for a few, like 10 minutes a day for about a month or two. And then I got reasonably good at the guitar and I still play to this day. I'm getting guitar lessons, it's all fun and games. And then in my third year of med school, I happened to have a piano in my room. And so I taught myself the piano, again, using YouTube tutorials and stuff. To this day, music is one of my favorite hobbies. I'm consistently trying to improve. And it's one of my dreams to one day busk on the London underground, be one of those people who sings with a guitar and stuff, maybe to raise money for charity. I just think it would be really fun. But to do that, you actually have to audition and you have to be good. So I'm taking singing lessons. I'm sort of taking piano lessons and I'm in the process of arranging guitar lessons as well. Now let's talk about the things that music has done for me. So Firstly, learning piano and guitar mostly like basically entirely through online tutorials on YouTube. Now this was interesting because other than coding and magic as I'll come to later, I didn't really learn a lot of things on the internet. And I think I kind of underestimated that if you want to learn anything in the world, you can just learn it on the internet. And I would find that people would see me play guitar or play piano and be like, oh, how long have you been having lessons for? I'd be like, what? I, I mean, I just, I just learned on, on the internet. And they were like, what? So you're self-taught? And I was like, well, is it really self-taught to be learned on the internet? Like surely anything is learned on the internet. And so for me, like being able to learn, learn this musical stuff from the internet has now given me the confidence that if I need to learn anything in the future, I can just learn it on the internet. And, and I'm, I'm often very surprised when it's, it's generally older people who don't realize that the internet is a thing or just don't realize the power of the internet that you can literally learn whatever the hell you want, who still have this model in their heads where it's like, you need formal training in something. You need to have lessons to get good at something. But actually for most things you can, make a pretty good start by just doing stuff on the internet. In fact, even in medical school, I went to Cambridge University, one of the best ranked medical schools in the world. Basically everyone I knew didn't really enjoy the lectures and in fact, instead taught themselves most of the syllabus by using the internet, by using things like Wikipedia, by using resources on YouTube, no, not even using textbook. There, there are so few people I know who actually use textbooks. Basically everyone taught themselves using the internet despite being at Cambridge University. So it's just one of those things where, where for me, like learning the music stuff really solidified this foundation of, okay, I can just learn whatever the hell I want on the internet. And the other interesting thing about the music stuff is that before I learned how to play the piano, I used to see people who could hear a song and then just be able to play it. And I used to think, oh my God, like mind blowing, how much innate talent that must require. This sounds like the hardest thing in the world. How can he possibly be doing that? And it was really this black box where I was like, you know, there's something mysterious going on in their brains where they can hear a song and just instantly play it on the piano. This was like the best thing ever. But as I started kind of cracking open that black box, I kind of realized that, oh, hang on, there is a method to the madness. And yeah, it's it's tricky, but these people who can play anything by ear, they're following a series of kind of mathematical formulae in their head. And if I can just understand these formulae, I can understand how to play stuff by ear. 
And so now I'm at the point where I can hear a song or if I know a song very well, I can just basically play it on the piano. And sometimes I'll do this where, you know, a friend is singing a song and I'll just play along. Or if I hear something like a film track, I'll play along on the piano. And people are always like, whoa, how do you do that? And I'm like, oh, wow. That was my response 10 years ago before I knew how to do this thing. And I think with like, this isn't just relevant to music. It's relevant to so many other aspects of life where we see someone do something and we think, oh my God, this must be a black box. And how, how can you possibly like, you know, often coding feels like a black box. Like I have no idea where to start. I don't know how it works. I'm actually listening to the biography of Elon Musk at the moment and about how it's so interesting how Elon Musk, you know, when starting SpaceX, everyone was like, oh, well, it costs $12 million to build a rocket. And he was like, all right, why, why does it do that? Like, what are the actual components of a rocket? Like, what do we need? We need this, we need the engine, we need the drive shaft, whatever it's called for a rocket. How much should these components cost? He built like a spreadsheet and said, oh, theoretically, we should be able to build a rocket for like 2 million. And everyone was like, what the hell? You can't just build a rocket. And he was like, why the hell not? Of course you can build a rocket. Like I've got the parts. We have enough people who know how to assemble a rocket. Let's just do it. And so he was very good at you know, taking apart this black box of rocket science, literally, and being like, oh, actually, if you open the black box, you find that there are all these components inside it. Not saying I'm like Elon Musk himself, obviously, lol. Uh, but I think the lessons I've learned from music are about cracking open the black box. And so if you're thinking of learning something, or if you're like, oh, I've, I've always wanted to learn how to paint, but I just don't know what it's like, or anything you feel where, wow, that person is so good at X, they must be really talented. I think, no, 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 there's a black box here. And yes, there, there's talent to a degree, but for the most part, there is method to the madness and I can figure it out if I really want to. All right, hobby number three is close up magic. Yes, this is the third hobby that's most changed my life. This started again um, as a nod to the inferiority complex I had when I was in secondary school, thinking I wasn't cool enough because all I was, you know, all I was was a massive nerd who got good grades. But at some point, I think when I was six, I think I was 17 at the time, I saw this magic show, Pen and Teller Fool Us on, on TV. And there was this guy called Michael Vincent who did an incredible card trick. I was like completely mind blown by this card trick. I was like, bloody hell, this is the best thing I've ever seen. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to learn how to do sleight of hand with cards so that in the future, I'll be able to do these sorts of tricks and impress people in school. And so it started off like that, but very quickly it morphed into something a bit more interesting. And I started doing performances. I performed at the local hospice. I performed at a restaurant. And then when I was at university, I actually used to get paid to do magic at events and parties and stuff. And in terms of how it's going today, like I'm actually auditioning for the prestigious magic circle. So I'm preparing a 12 minute act with like tricks and stories and like a narrative and stuff. Uh, and I'm working with this guy called Matthew Lamotti, who is a friend of mine now. Uh, he has a YouTube channel as well that you can check out, link in the video description. He's being my kind of magic coach and like coaching me along to try and get like a really cool magic act for the magic circle audition. But now let's talk about the different ways in which this, this changed me. So firstly, magic is amazing because when you do magic and you're performing for actual people, it's a real exercise in embracing discomfort. Like, you know, when you're first learning a card trick and you're like trying to show a friend and your hands are like, like genuinely shaking this is the case for me, my hands would be genuinely shaking and I'd be getting the slights wrong and I'd be like, oh, you know, just like so, so, so awkward. But it's one of those weird domains in which however much raw talent you have in like just, I don't know, being charismatic or whatever, it's actually quite hard to perform compelling magic in front of people where part of it is like performance, part of it is like technical skills and a lot of things get weaved together within the context of a magical performance, even if you are just showing a card trick to your friends. And so really my whole journey in magic has been really a journey of embracing discomfort, uh, seeking discomfort as the folks at Yes Theory would say. Um, I remember I'd be kind of sweating through my shirt at school when showing tricks. And then I, I, I wanted to get a volunteer position at the local hospice because I needed it for my medical school application. But I'd like missed a deadline or something and there was this long ass application process. So instead I sent them an email saying, hey, you know, would you like me to perform magic for the residents of the hospice, the patients of the hospice for free? I'm a magician and I can do a magic show. And they were like, oh, interesting. We'd love you to perform at our Christmas party. And then I was like absolutely shitting myself. I was like, bloody hell, I need to come up with a magic show for their Christmas party for these people in a hospice and their families and kids and stuff. It was really scary, but it went really well and people seemed to like it and even better, uh, afterwards, they were like, oh, we really loved you so much. Would you would you be down for doing magic maybe once every two weeks for the residents? And I was like, hell yes. This is what got me my volunteer gig at this hospice, which is what one of the things that helped my medical school application. And it was kind of getting in through the, the third door, as Alex Benayan would call it, where most people were applying for this long ass application process, which was very competitive. Whereas I kind of went around the queue and said, hey, <laughs> let me do some magic tricks uh, and kind of got my slot at the hospice that way. There was also like a very scary moment where uh, one of my uncles, one of our family friends hired me to perform magic at his restaurant. He owned a restaurant and there was this corporate like party at the restaurant. And he said, oh, you can be the magician. 
And I was like, I was like, all right, I got this. I can do contracts to cor corporate crowd. And when I got there, I was so, so scared. And the very first trick I tried for the very first group completely failed. I completely messed up. They kind of laughed at me. They were like, oh, it's okay, haha. <laughs> It was like the sort of these four or five like older were like white dudes in their like 40s or something wearing suits. And they just was like, it, it just didn't work. And I kind of clammed up and I didn't do any more tricks the rest of the night. And I kind of ran away with my tail between my legs. And like, that was an interesting experience because it's probably the most embarrassed I've been <laughs> in almost anything in my life. Uh, and I realized at the end of it that, okay, that actually wasn't so bad. It was like really terrifying at the time but it helped me realize that what doesn't kill you makes you stranger or whatever. And then at university, when I'd be performing at like balls and parties and stuff, that was a real test of approach anxiety uh, and overcoming that. Imagine you're at, a, you're at this big ball in this kind of fancy, fancy, fancy venue. Everyone's dressed up in black tie and like dresses and like fancy ass stuff going around. And everyone's kind of there with their friends and there are all these groups all around and doing things. And you as the magician, like you have to go up to a group of people and be like, hi guys. Um, how, how, how's your evening going? And they're like, oh yeah, who the, who, who the frick are you? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm, I'm the magician. Do you want to see a magic trick? And it's, it's so like, even thinking about it now, like is making me break out into sweats. But that's what I was doing for about three years worth of my ball and party seasons. And I even got to the point where I was being paid like $200 an hour to do magic at these fancy venues. And people would like it, it used to be fun. You know, if you were to ask me now, it'd be like, hey, go up to this random group of people and introduce yourself. It would still be scary. But I think the magic thing gave me a taste of how to overcome the discomfort associated with approaching groups. And I think that was a big part of what made me more comfortable to put myself out there on this YouTube channel and on my website, because I already had experience doing it in this kind of weird niche setting of close-up magic. And like, you know, I, I get dozens of messages each day <laughs> on Instagram and emails and stuff from people saying, hey, I wanna start a YouTube channel, but I'm too scared to put myself out there. And yeah, I totally get it. It's exactly the same fear as you get, you know, the fear of rejection, the fear of looking like a fool, but uh, you know, the more kind of baby steps you can take at doing this, you kind of realize after a while that 99% of the fear is actually just in your head and there's actually nothing scary about doing this thing, but it does take a level of practice to get to the point where you're more comfortable with putting yourself out there if that's what you wanna do. And finally, hobby number four is teaching. So this started off as a hobby. I used to do it for fun in, even in like primary school when I was like seven, you know, I was I was a nerd from day one. So people would ask me for like help on their maths or English problems. And I would be like, oh, you know, happily explain how to do it and what the thought process is. And this used to be really fun. And then when I was in secondary school, so when I was around 14, I got a job at a local maths and English study center called Kumon, shout out to Kumon. Um, and I started helping kids with their maths and that was fun. And I was making like four pound 50 an hour. So like $6 an hour, which was pretty good for a 14 year old. I was like, I'm rich. I'm making like $20 a week, yes, check me out. And then throughout school and throughout university as well, I was big into teaching and I was a big like proponent that anytime I would learn something, I would be thinking, oh, okay, next year, I can teach the kids in the year below how to do this thing that I've just learned. And so I'd be preparing teaching sessions and that was really fun. And in a way, this YouTube channel is just that same teaching hobby, but a bit more at scale. Instead of t talking to a class of students, I'm now talking to a camera right now, which feels a bit weird, but the fact that I've been teaching for so long and actually one of my, like my first business at university, Six Med was entirely based on teaching and that business changed my life as well. More on that in a video over there. So really teaching is probably the fourth hobby that's most changed my life. Now in terms of the things I've learned from it that maybe you guys can apply if you're so interested. One of the main insights was that you don't need to be an expert if you wanna help someone. What, I, what I've what i realized over the years of teaching is that no one really cares about qualifications. No one cares if you're an expert as long as you can provide value to them. And C.S. Lewis has this thing that he calls, I think, the curse of the, the curse of the expert or the curse of knowledge, which is that the, this idea that often when we are beginners, the people best placed to teach us are not the professors who've been doing it for 50 years. They're in fact the people who were doing it last year. So someone who's just one step ahead of us or like even, even along the same path, like when I was in medical school, even with people in my year, we would be explaining stuff to each other because some of us were better at some subjects than others or I just understood something better than the others or just read it more recently. And it's like teaching becomes this like nice way of bringing everyone along without it feeling like, a, oh my God, I have to be an expert. Otherwise I'm not qualified to teach anyone. And on that note, like doing the teaching thing for so long has made me realize that people only really care about the value that you can give to them. I have never seen a medical student leave a teaching session that was actually good thinking, oh, well, I wonder if the teacher had a medical educational qualification. I wonder if they've done their postgraduate degree in medical education. Like it's just not the stuff anyone cares about. Like no one wor like worries, wonders, is the teacher really qualified to teach about this? Like maybe they might be, maybe they're not, but like if they know what they're talking about and they can teach it to you in a, in a way that's engaging and fun, 
it doesn't matter if they're a professor in their 50s or if a student in the year above. The point is it's just teaching and teaching is just giving value to other people and helping them along in the process. And I think that's what holds a lot of us back with a lot of things in life, like this worry that, oh, I'm not qualified enough to do X. But what teaching for so long has made me realize is that that's, that's kind of a myth. You can just do it. And if people like it, then yeah, they like it and they don't care how qualified you are for the most part. So those were four hobbies that's most changed my life. Uh, there is a fifth, which I would put like writing on the internet. I'm not gonna talk about that in, in this video. I'll, I'll talk about that in that video over there, which is called how writing online made me a millionaire. So if you're interested in that, definitely check out that video. But thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.